Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where some of the best advice we've ever received is to live every week like it's Shark Week, and that's why we are thrilled to be talking Sharks and Rays with you today. Ironically, we are in the middle of America. We're joining you live from Missouri. We've got Kevin here at Johnny Morris's Wonders of Wildlife to talk us through the amazing world of sharks, rays, and other elasmobranchs. And he'll let me know pretty soon if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, but we're excited to dive in with all of you here. Now, one thing you guys should know about Kevin is unlike the stars of today's show, he neither bites nor stings. And so he wants to hear a lot from you. Please use the chat box to the right of the screen. He's going to ask you some questions to find out what you know and want to know about these amazing animals. So answer his questions there. And if you have any questions of your own, please feel free to type those in there. And in the last 10 minutes or so, I'll interview Kevin with your questions. We'll get you as many answers as we can. So with that said, let's have some fun with this. Please keep it interactive. I think we're ready to dive in. So let me introduce you to your teacher for today, Kevin from Wonders of Wildlife. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Kevin, and I am coming to you live from Wonders and Wildlife, all Wonders of Wildlife, all the way in Springfield, Missouri. Now, today I'm going to be helping you all learn about the incredible world of sharks and rays. But first, I want to talk a little bit about who I am and where I work. Now, once you set foot inside Wonders of Wildlife on this slide here, you can walk over one and a half miles of exhibits. Now this building, this massive building here, houses both a wildlife gallery containing specimens and artifacts from all over the world and an aquarium. Now we're talking. This aquarium has over 35,000 live animals from around the globe. And yes, that does include sharks. As you can see here on this slide, Wonders of Wildlife is home to several species of shark that you can encounter on your visit. Now our friend pictured here is one of our brown sharks, but we also have sand tigers, nurse, zebra, bonnethead, black nose, epaulette, and bamboo sharks, not to mention a whole lot of stingrays. Now that's what I call a fantastic group of animals. Now one of the best parts of my job here is getting to share my love and knowledge of animals with others, and that is exactly what we're going to be doing here in a moment. But first, I would love to get to know you guys a little better. I love learning what people's favorite animals are because I think you can tell a lot about a person from that. So why don't you all go ahead and use that chat box there and go ahead and type your favorite animal in the whole world so I can see it there. All right. I am starting to get some really good answers there. Sharks? Oh, you guys are in the right place if you love sharks. Ooh, elephants. Great answer. Seen a lot of cats and dogs. You know, you can never go wrong with those. My, you guys have some awesome taste in animals. You might not think I do. My favorite animal is the giant centipede. Ooh, I know, creepy crawlies, right? But centipedes are actually super helpful and they have kind of an unfair reputation just because they look scary. Hang on a minute. That kind of reminds me of the topic of our lesson today, sharks and stingrays. They can both be a little bit scary, but they bring incredible benefits to the environment with them. Are we ready to get started? Great. So. Like I said today, we are going to be talking all about sharks and rays. So let's start by testing what you might already know. I'm going to be doing this throughout the lesson. So if you want to go ahead and respond in the chat box, I would love that. Question number one, I want you to go ahead and type, do you think sharks and rays have bones? Go ahead and leave your answer in the chat box if you think that our fin friends here have bones. Okay. Okay. We're kind of split here. I'm seeing a lot of yeses, a lot of noes. We're pretty even. Are you guys ready for this? Sharks do have skeletons, but they don't have bones. It's a little confusing, right? So why don't we take a closer look? Now, sharks are jawed fishes, which makes them vertebrates. Now, a vertebrate is any animal with a spinal cord, kind of like this little chunk I'm holding up here. Might be hard to see, but this is a piece of spinal column from a ciliorhinoid shark. Now, those are your cat sharks. You're really friendly looking little guys. Now, all of you guys at home have spinal cords of your own running down your backs. Now, these spinal cords help the central nervous system send nerve signals all over the body, and that coordinates things like movement. And in vertebrates, many of those moving parts will find themselves sitting around the skeletal structure of the animal. But a skeleton doesn't actually need to be made out of bones like ours. In sharks and rays, that skeleton is made up of cartilage. Now, cartilage, as you can see here on this slide, is not what we'd expect a skeleton to be made of, but it does make up a lot of our bodies. Cartilage can be found in our ears, in our noses, 
and in our knees. I'm not going to try and stand on one leg to lift my knee up to the camera, but you guys get the idea. In sharks and rays, which are what we call elasmobranchs, perfect pronunciation by Brian, by the way, the skeleton is made mostly of cartilage. Now, why would an animal want to have a skeleton made out of cartilage instead of bone? Sure, our bones break sometimes, and they need a lot of calcium, but they're pretty sturdy, all things considered. So why cartilage? Well, it's simple. Sharks hate to waste energy if they can help it. Cartilage is less dense than bone, meaning a six foot long shark is gonna weigh a lot less than a big bony grouper of the same size. This means sharks are gonna be moving through the water a lot faster than most of their competition. Cartilage is also surprisingly flexible. You can really bend your nose here, which lets sharks conquer all sorts of environmental challenges. Now, speaking of environmental challenges, boy, are they great at adapting to them. Sharks and rays are found all throughout the world's salt water, from the shallow tropical waters of the Caribbean to the bone, or cartilage, chilling Arctic Ocean. And as you can see there on the lower right of the screen, they can also be found in freshwater environments. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, most sharks are exothermic. It's what we used to call cold-blooded. Now, that means they can't make their own body heat like you or me. You know, you could put a sweater on a great white shark. It would look cute. Wouldn't really trap any heat. Now, the sharks that frequent colder habitats, though, like the Greenland, poor beagle, and salmon sharks, have amazing adaptations that will help them survive. Now, salmon sharks will use their own muscle movements to heat up and share the heat with the water sucked in by the gills. And Greenland sharks, they are chock full of toxic chemicals like urea. That actually keeps them from freezing, like natural antifreeze. Now, as I did mention earlier, some sharks and rays will even make their way into freshwater. Bull sharks are infamous. They are predators known for traveling hundreds of miles into freshwater. They've even been found in the Mississippi River. That's pretty close to home for us here in Springfield. Stingrays are even better adapted to freshwater, though, with different genuses of rays spending their whole lives in rivers. Now, this is impressive because most freshwater and saltwater fish, and animals in general, they have a lot of trouble swapping habitats due to the amount of salt sprinkled in uh, their bodies there. It can get thrown off balance. That's called osmoregulation when they have to control that, and sharks and rays are just that great at it. Now, we talk a lot about sharks and rays, but as you can see here on this slide, not all cartilaginous fish are sharks and rays. The subjects of our lessons today are what we call the elasmobranchs, which include sharks, rays, sawfish, and all the strange ray relatives we're going to touch on later. But holocephali, which means the complete heads, they contain the strange looking fellows on the right side of the screen there, chimeras. Now the chimera gets its name from a monster from Greek myth that has the head of a lion, body of a goat, and the tail of a snake. Now these mysterious deep sea fish really don't have any of those things, but they also don't have a stomach. Food is actually gonna go directly to the intestines. And that among other things is what makes them so different from the elasmobranchs. We're gonna cover the elasmobranchs though. So as you can see here on this slide, elasmobranchs are usually going to have five to seven gill slits. Those gill slits are gonna intake water and extract oxygen from it. This allows them to breathe beneath the waves. Now five is the normal amount for sharks, but the shark pictured here is a six gill shark. There are also seven gill sharks. And generally speaking, shark species with more gill slits are more ancient species. Another defining feature of sharks and rays are their scales. Now, if you guys at home ever get a chance to touch a stingray in a safe setting, you might notice it is a bit like touching a slimy but gritty pancake. If you touch a shark, however, you might drop the word slimy and instead say it feels rough like sandpaper or concrete. The way both animals feel is due to their unique scales, which we call placoid scales or denticles. Now your placoid scales are shaped like little teeth and they're actually constructed a lot like teeth too. Each placoid scale is coated in enamel Enamel is the same substance we need coating our teeth to keep them healthy and protected. And it forms a natural suit of armor around sharks and rays. I just mentioned that the texture of sharks and rays is usually different, but let's dive into some of the other differences between the two. So sharks and rays are both closely related, relatively speaking, only having diverged from each other about 200 million years ago, according to many scientists. But in general, they have some differences that help tell them apart. Now, your sharks are going to have elongated bodies most of the time. Even your flattened bottom dwellers like angel sharks, they are still going to be much more stretched out than many rays. Sharks also have gill slits and eyes located on the sides of their head. Now, you might be wondering, why don't they have eyes placed on the front of their heads like many land predators, such as owls or cats? The reason for that 
is they have so many other super senses at work hunting prey. The monocular vision of eyes in the front really doesn't help them out all that much. Lastly, sharks don't have pectoral fins fused to their heads. The pectoral fins are actually uh, held like little steering wheels off to the side there. Now let's move on to rays. What makes them special? Rays on the other hand, or fins, are going to be a lot flatter than sharks. The gills have also moved to the underside of their bodies, along with the mouth in most cases. And the pectoral fins have fused with the head to form majestic flapping wings. Now, sharks and rays may have some differences, but they're both pretty ancient. You guys might have already known that, but many scientists believe sharks and rays have been around for at least 400 million years. To put that in perspective, that is longer than trees have been around. Prehistoric sharks and range, sharks and rays range from eel-like sharks that share the world with giant salamanders to this behemoth I'm holding up here, the megalodon. A lot of you guys are probably very familiar with Megalodon. Now, Megalodon was an extinct relative of Mako and Great White Sharks. It's actually closer related to the Mako shark. And I can already tell a lot of you guys want to know if there's a chance Megalodon isn't extinct. It could still be out there somewhere. Well, unfortunately, I am here to tell you that our friend the Meg is absolutely not around anymore. Whales became too difficult to track and hunt as they moved away from these super predators. And modern great white sharks, they are way too strong to compete against. So, all right, guys, it is time to test your knowledge again. You guys may have remembered I mentioned earlier that sharks and rays have super senses. I want you to go ahead and type in the chat box there what kind of super senses you think sharks and rays have. Drop those answers in the chat box so I can see exactly what we're putting down. Uh huh. We are starting to get some great answers here right off the bat. Super hearing, great guess. And there it is. I am seeing super smell. Bingo, you guys are exactly right. Now, sharks are packing both super smell and some unique senses they could pull off only underwater. So let's go check it out. My favorite shark super sense is the ampule of Lorenzini. That might sound a lot like a fancy pasta name, but it's talking about these holes and pits you can see on the underside of that tiger shark there. Check out those deep black dots. Now, those dots are actually small pits filled with gel and nerve bundles. These allow them to sense the bioelectricity of animals all around them. Every living thing has a minuscule electric field around them, that little spark of life inside of them. And the ampullae let sharks track those fields with ease. Hammerhead sharks, like the one pictured on screen, actually have a much wider head there because it lets them scan for wider fields as they patrol the seabed. This lets them find their favorite food, stingrays. These electroreceptors may also be the reason why sharks love boats, cages, and other strange metal objects. The electric fields produced by them might just be too good to pass up investigating. Now, another adaptation possessed by sharks and other fish is what we call the lateral line system. The lateral line system seen here is that raised sort of line along the side of that leopard shark. It's gonna be used to detect changes in water pressure from all directions. This gives the shark a nearly 360 degree scan of its surrounding which combined with the eyes on the side of its head gives them an advantage that makes them almost impossible to sneak up on. Now, being able to detect changes in water pressure means that if something in the water moves or splashes from the tiniest little fish to the largest whale in the world, a nearby shark is sure to know about it. If you've ever been in the water before, maybe at the pool, think about if you were able to feel the effect of splashes happening under the surface. That is a bit like the basic principle of the lateral line. Lateral line systems are also much better at reading the results of water pressure though, even telling sharks the size and location of prey or predators. <clears throat> Lastly, sharks have an amazing sense of smell. While the idea of sharks swarming and feeding frenzies from a single drop of blood is exaggerated, sharks do possess a sense of smell 10,000 times stronger than ours. The water also helps these scent trails scatter and disperse farther, lets them carry farther, meaning these sharks often have a free roadmap to nearby fish or injured animals. All right, guys, great job so far. Let's go ahead and test your knowledge again. Can everyone put in the chat one kind of shark species? It can be any kind of shark in the whole world. Maybe put down one of your favorites. Wow, we got answers right away. You guys are so fast at this, so good at this. All right. I am seeing there, what is it? A lot of whale sharks, great job, very friendly picks. I see great white sharks, can never go wrong with the champion of Shark Week. 
Cookie cutter shark. You guys are doing amazing. You're bringing out some real oddballs here. Now sharks are an incredibly diverse group. So let's take a closer look at them. Now, although many of us do recognize the typical shark shape, they have a lot more biodiversity than people realize. These three are some of my favorite shark species in the whole world. Thresher sharks there have that elongated whip-like tail that actually will allow them to stun prey, schools of bait fish. They use it like a whip. Wabagongs in the middle there will actually mimic seaweed and they'll just lay flat on the seafloor, smushed down, camouflaging right until prey walks right in front of their mouths. And Greenland sharks, as we mentioned earlier, they're about the same size as great white sharks, but they live in the Arctic Circle. And they have been known to swallow reindeer and even polar bears. How crazy is that? They come in all kinds of sizes as well as shapes too. The world's smallest shark, the dwarf lantern shark, only reaches about six to seven inches long. That's enough to fit in your hand. <laughs> On the other side of things, the whale shark is the world's largest shark, measuring over 40 feet long. To put that in perspective for you guys, it could be longer than your school bus. Most sharks, however, are going to fall into that, you know, middle range, six to seven feet. That is a great height for basketball, but not that large in the grand scheme of the ocean there. Now, most sharks what are what we call pelagic sharks. If you're a pelagic animal, you are spending your entire life in the wide open ocean. Great whites, blue sharks, mako sharks. These are all prime examples of pelagic sharks. Those fins are typically used for steering and performing really quick turns in pursuit of prey. Now, benthic sharks, on the other hand, these guys are a lot cuddlier looking, though I still wouldn't recommend it. These guys are typically uh, in possession of fins that let them kind of like army crawl back and forth across the seafloor. Some of them, like epaulette sharks, can even survive crawling from tide pool to tide pool as they prowl for crustaceans and shellfish. Now, the stereotypical, the typical shark shape we think of, that would be a requiem shark. Requiem sharks are members of the family Carcharhinidae. And if that sounds like a mouthful, you can think of them as bull sharks, reef sharks, and lemon sharks. Now, there is a little bit of mystery around where the name requiem sharks come from. Requiem may either mean rest, as in death, or uh, it could be referring to the word rechigné, which is sort of a grimace, with, it's a grimacy face with your teeth exposed like that. Either way, they are fantastic hunters that should not be underestimated. Now let's go ahead and move on to our flattened friends, the rays. I want you to hit that chat box again and type one type of uh, ray in the chat that you know of. Almost gave away an answer there with uh, the S at the start of my sentence. Let's see if we get some great answers. There it is, lots and lots of stingrays. I have never seen so many rays in one place before, not even at Wonders of Wildlife's own ray touch pool. Manta rays, amazing. Electric rays, you guys are rock stars. There are a lot of great answers and a lot of great ray species to go over. So why don't we jump right in? Now, rays aren't all just round sand colored animals. There's actually a lot of biodiversity hidden in this group. Blue spotted whip tail rays are a lot shyer than that beautiful coloration might suggest. Manta rays are the world's largest rays and they're also pelagic open ocean dwellers. And that right here is our old friend, the freshwater stingray, hailing all the way from the Amazon River Basin. Now, while we're mostly focused on sharks and rays today, a lot of other oddball elasmobranchs are more closely related to rays than sharks. The sawfish, despite being called a fish and shaped like a shark, is actually more closely related to rays as seen here with its sides devoid of gill slits and its eyes sitting on top of its head there. Guitar fish are also sometimes called shark rays because the way their body kind of looks like a mishmash fusion of the two. And while skates may look like triangular stingrays, they have two key differences. Skates don't usually sting. They typically have these little like thorny bumps all over them and they lay eggs. As you can see on screen now on the slide, there is a mermaid's purse. And don't get too excited. It's actually just a name used for the egg cases of skates and some benthic shark species like horn sharks. The coiled strands on the corners there like spaghetti, those help actually anchor the case to the surroundings until it hatches. A baby elasmobranch is called a pup. And while rays give live birth to their pups, skates lay those eggs instead. Now, what many people have questions about is the stingray stinger. I mean, it's in the name after all. A stingray stinger is connected to a pumping venom gland at its base, and it bears dozens of barbs or hooks to make it almost impossible to remove from predators. Here in this zoomed in shot that we're looking at right now, you can actually see just what those barbs look like. Pretty nasty, right? 
However, stingrays prefer to kind of make a hasty retreat and run from predators when they can help it. So if you shuffle around in waters when you're at the beach where stingrays are known to live, you should be safe since you're alerting them of your approach. And lastly, a stingray stinger is actually a modified denticle or placoid scale like we learned about. And in captivity, we can actually painlessly trim those every couple of months to make sure it's a safe environment for both the animals and our keepers here at Wonders of Wildlife. So if you ever get a chance at a facility to see a ray, just know that you're safe. Now, a stingray's eyes are set on top of its head to uh, help scout for predators while they remain buried in the sand. Now, this also prevents any sand or debris from getting kind of uh, stuck in its eyeballs there while it's burying itself. Now, at our stingray touch pool here at WOW, our stingrays give amazing high fives. But in the wild, those wings are used for other purposes. Now, the most obvious use of those wings is for movement. Flapping those wings actually will propel the stingray through the water instead of its tail like a shark would use. These wings will also help trap prey underneath its body when they're feeding. And they can even be used to flap away sand covering camouflaged animals. <coughs> Lastly, those wings will also help with the ray's own camouflage. They'll actually push sand away and allow the ray to kick up a huge mess that covers up its entire body, making them almost invisible to predators. Now, it's that time already. Let's get ready to use that chat box once again. I want everyone to type in the chat box one thing they think sharks and rays like to eat. I'll give you a moment there. Really think about what's on the menu for these uh, thin friends. Fish, that's totally a big one. Seals, another spot on answer. Crustaceans like crabs scuttling around, absolutely right. And a great vocab word. I am seeing a ton of amazing answers. So let's see what's on the menu. There is a surprisingly large amount of diversity in what sharks and rays eat. But let's start with the most peaceful ones, planktivores. Now, planktivores are filter feeders. They're exactly what they sound like. They are going to filter down microscopic phytoplankton and zooplankton by the millions. Those archways you can see inside of that basking shark's mouth, those are what we call gill rakers. They kind of work like pool skimmers or rakes to kind of pull those bits of plankton out of the water. And basking sharks are actually what we call burst feeders, which means they are going to keep on swimming at top speeds with their mouth wide open and just see what they can rack up. You can kind of think of these uh, strainers, these gill rakers, as a whale's baleen too. Basking sharks, whale sharks, and manta rays are all great examples of filter feeders and planktivores. Now, most sharks and many rays, or most rays and many sharks, love to chow down on hard-shelled crustaceans like crabs or lobsters and bivalves like uh, clams and oysters. These tough shells require sturdy teeth capable of crushing them to pieces, which is why many of them have jaws like these ones I'm holding now. These are horn shark jaws. Now I'm going to hold them up here so you guys can see these teeth don't look very menacing. In fact, they actually form these sort of plates here that are used to crack straight through the shells of crustaceans. Now, piscivorous sharks are those that eat mostly fish, although squid and other small fast-moving prey are also on the menu. These thin curved teeth act like fish hooks and they keep slippery prey from wriggling free from their uh, mouth. It's like a trap. Now, these are the teeth you came here to see generalist carnivores. Now these are sharks that really don't care too much about what they're eating as long as they're comfortable eating it. And they are amazing at finding food they're comfortable at eating. Great white sharks, tiger sharks, and bull sharks all have jaws like this and they all fall into this category. Their teeth are going to work like miniature chicken, <laughs> miniature chicken knives, miniature kitchen knives, which you could use to cut chicken potentially. Now they are used to cut a lot more than chicken in the wild. These tear through large chunks of prey from large fish, uh, even ranging up to whales and dolphins sometimes. Now, even though they are amazing at moving side to side and tearing chunks off of prey, these teeth also get kind of torn up on their own there. Elesmobranchs, including rays, will actually lose teeth throughout their entire lives, not just as children like we do with our baby teeth. And just one shark, can actually use up 35,000 teeth over its whole lifetime. Now, sharks aren't the mindless eating machines we once thought they were. Although they were once called the trash cans of the sea because they would follow your ship in uh, the olden days and eat what was thrown overboard, that's just working smarter, not harder. It's free food. We now know that sharks are surprisingly cunning hunters and will even team up with seabirds, dolphins, and billfish to pick apart gigantic bait balls like the one you see here. And because they are so intelligent, as well as surprisingly timid and shy, 
people are very rarely on the menu for sharks, despite what the movies might tell you. Most bites against people are just well-meaning investigations. And even mammal-eating sharks like great whites, they'd probably prefer a seal to a Steven. Now, let's go ahead and test some knowledge again. I want to know what you think. How do these sharks and rays affect us and impact us? They give us great movies about sharks, but what else? They're part of the ecosystem. We are going to learn about that. They're fun to visit at aquariums. These are great answers, everybody. Let's see how they match up. Now, sharks are an irreplaceable part of marine ecosystems because in most cases, these are your apex predators. These are predators with the fewest number of connections to them in the food web that are eating them. Now, their presence will actually shape how other sea creatures act. And that is essential in keeping balance in a habitat. These are amazing hunters. So they can act as population control for fish and other uh, animals like mammals even. Uh, they will also be hosts for thousands of parasite species, including leeches and copepods. And that will actually support fish like cleaner wrasses who now have a job cleaning parasites off of them. And although it is sad, when a shark or a ray reaches the end of its life, those massive bodies will make massive meals as they sink to the seafloor. Down in the depths, thousands of scavengers wait and they rely on the deaths of large animals like whales and sharks to feast. They can survive months without food down there because they know eventually a shark or a whale is gonna fall and they can gorge themselves, they can pig out. Now, sharks also help raise money by driving the ecotourism industry. Aquariums, shark cage dives, and scuba expeditions all raise both money and awareness of shark conservation. Those incredible memories formed by interacting with wild sharks. Can you imagine being face to face with that great white in that cage there? Or even just seeing them in an aquarium, or maybe even just reading about them. All of those connections between you and nature might pay off in the long run. They might make you want to do your best possible to help keep sharks safe. Now, what about stingrays? What do they do for us? Everyone type in the chat box one way they think stingrays and their relatives impact us. I'll give you a moment there. Remember, use that chat box. I love to see your answers. I'm seeing answers here. They're cute. They certainly are. There's that connection between us and nature again. See, it's building already. They keep crab populations down like sharks do. Amazing jobs. Great work, everyone. Let's get into it. So, Benthic rays down on the seabed will actually disturb the sand constantly as they're kind of rifling through it for food or to hide themselves. And that keeps the sand bed oxygenated. Now, an oxygenated sand bed prevents toxic gases from building up. And it also creates a little micro habitats for micro invertebrates to live, which help form the lower levels of the food web or food chain. And that will help support entire ecosystems. Now, thinking bigger here, if you're a big animal, you're gonna leave some pretty big waste droppings. And those droppings help feed the phytoplankton that form the base of the food web there. The almost all marine life that we know of or that we can see uh, relies on. So since they can do so much for us, what's something nice we can do to help out sharks and rays? Well, there are three easy ways that you can have a big impact. The first is by making sure you and your families are eating uh, what we call fish or dolphin safe seafood. If you see a label or a little paragraph there that says seafood is labeled as dolphin safe, that means that the nets used to capture it have holes that dolphins can swim through or mechanisms that dolphins can use to escape, which means chances are sharks and sea turtles can also have an easier time avoiding being accidentally caught. We call that bycatch. Now, bycatch or accidental catch can be extremely uh, dangerous for these animal populations. And that is why we have to be so careful of it. Now. You can also help out by visiting conservation institutions. These institutions all help ensure that sharks and rays will be around for a long time and educate others about changing uh, their minds about sharks. Any visit to an aquarium or similar attraction helps out a lot. And finally, you can tell other people something you learned here today. You never know just how far one weird memorable fact might go when it comes to making people want to protect sharks. Who knows? I bet some of you guys might become shark scientists someday and make it your dream to protect elasmobranchs. I know they'd appreciate it. And I know all of you can do it if you set your mind to it. I hope you all enjoyed learning about the wonderful world of sharks and rays here today with me.
I think that's pretty safe to say that was so much fun, Kevin. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks all of you out there for really incredible participation and, uh, and some really fantastic questions. So, um, so Kevin, we're going to put you on the hot seat. Um, and uh, these guys have had some great questions. Please, everyone, keep your questions coming. But like Kevin mentioned, you may have these kind of you know crazy random facts that uh, would inspire you to become a shark scientist or uh, you know an oceanographer, or marine biologist, and we want to give everybody those chances. So keep your uh, your zany questions coming. Um, one that, that came up a decent amount was we you know we think of sharks as as these you know kind of intense predators, but you even mentioned how small some of them get and how much diversity is there. What are some of the predators that attack sharks? So they're top of the food chain in, in many cases, but who goes after them? Predators of sharks are actually not what you'd expect them to be. First of all, a lot of shark species are pretty cannibalistic. They really don't mind if they're chowing down on smaller sharks than they are. And uh, the big one that surprises people, dolphins and toothed whales. Dolphins will actually kill sharks. And orcas have even been seen uh, actually um, killing great white sharks to eat their liver. They know that there's amazing vitamins in there that are necessary for their brain development. So orcas have been going after great whites in uh, South Africa. Sperm whales are also these amazing unmatched predators in the deep sea. So if you thought them eating giant squid was cool, think about the fact that a sperm whale can also take out a giant shark. I think that's pretty neat. That is pretty crazy. Yeah, you just... Like you mentioned the movies, we think of sharks as the, the ultimate attacking machine, but it's wild to, uh, to envision that, uh, that some of those battles are, are going on down there. Since you brought up whales uh, and whale sharks, a um, couple folks were, were pretty impressed by how big whale sharks are and wanted to know, how did they compare in size to the biggest animals of the ocean? Blue whales, other whales, are they, you know, is a whale shark about average size for a whale? Is, is it smaller, but it's the biggest shark? How do they get their name and then how do they compare? So whale sharks get their name both from their massive size and the fact that they are filter feeders like the baleen whales most uh, seafarers thought of. Now, 40 feet and upwards may seem large, but a blue whale, they've got nothing on a blue whale. A blue whale is 100 feet long and that's just our confirmed reports. Who knows what's down there? And there are many whale species that do actually also outshine whale sharks in terms of their length. But if you're a whale shark fan, don't let that hurt you. They are the largest sharks and the largest fish in the sea right now. Basking sharks and megamouth sharks are the other big two. And those are also large filter feeders, just coincidentally enough. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, there's a certain point where just big is big, right? 40 feet versus 100 feet, uh, you know, for you and me, um, they're giant. That's uh, that's pretty amazing. Um, so thank you. Um, let me, I'm looking at, at some notes here. You guys had some great ones um, that uh, that I was I was taking out. Well, this one, this one fascinated me. Someone, you know, you mentioned uh, some sharks were, were predators of rays. Um if they're related, how does that work? Why do they attack rays if they are related? Or another person was asking sort of how far back are they related? Like, you know, how, when did their, um, you know, evolutionary, you know, branches diverge? So how, how far back do they go to be related? And, and does that help inform why some sharks are okay with eating rays? So... Uh, although we might find it a little strange to maybe think about eating a chimpanzee or another primate, a lot of animals in general really don't share that sort of like uh, that sort of stipulation. They really don't mind what they're eating as long as it's easy to catch and it'll fit in their mouth. As we mentioned in our slides, sharks and rays actually diverged about 200 million years ago, and they've been around for about 400 million years, scientists think. So there is a hefty degree of divergence from them. And even if there wasn't, Food is food. If rays are amazing prey for you because you're able to pick up on that wide electrical field profile, you're going to get these amazing adaptations like a hammerhead and you're just going to, you know, you're going to make a business out of it. You are going to make your living hunting down rays and fish. But uh, rays can sometimes turn the table. Uh, rays do have those amazing jaws there. And in captivity, they've even been seen trying to take chunks out of other rays and other sharks. They just really don't see it the way that we do. That's fascinating. I guess 200 million years is a long enough time for them to not feel like first or second cousins. So there's, you know, there's, there's been enough time for them to see themselves as pretty distinct, even the individual species. So, um, so yeah, so, so thankful for that. So now, so we know that they'll, they'll attack each other sometimes. A lot of, a lot of comments came up about what do we do in order to stay safe? So, uh, so if we see, do you happen to see a shark somewhere? Um, you're out in the ocean. There's still some some swimming weeks left for uh, for a lot of us in in the summer. 
any advice? How do we how do we look for sharks? Should we be looking for sharks? If we happen to come into contact one with one, what should we do? So you should not be looking for sharks, uh, in my opinion. There are amazing ecotourism uh, groups and uh, captive institutions like aquariums where you can see sharks. But the biggest one is no splashing. I cannot stress that enough. Remember, they have those amazing, amazing lateral line systems that go down their body. And uh, they can use those to sense water pressure. Although they are not trying to go after people, and I cannot stress that enough, they don't want to hurt you. They're still very intelligent, curious animals. And if they hear you splashing or feel you splashing, they're going to investigate. Staying calm is also another big one. If you see a shark, uh, obviously try to make your way away from it. But don't panic. Don't start immediately flailing and splashing because that's just going to kind of feed into itself. And that is going to make the shark really want to know what's going on with you. Most of the time, our encounters with sharks are you see a shark, it sees you, and it just bolts the other way. And we like to keep it that way. So remember, no splashing and keep calm. Sharks are not out to get you, but we shouldn't be out to get them either. Yes, I like that. Yeah, they're not out to get us. So if, if we don't give them extra reason to get us, um, we're not exactly what they want. Um, although stay calm is easy to say in, uh, in this <laughs> format, probably a little harder to do if we see them out there. Um, but then again, they're, they're not coming looking for you. What about rays? Um, I think, you know, a couple people mentioned they've seen rays. They've been out swimming oh, in clear yeah. waters and have seen rays beneath them and those kind of things. Uh, how can you tell if a ray is potentially dangerous, potentially a, a stingray? Um, and uh, what should you do if you see rays in the water? When in doubt, when in doubt, always assume that a wild animal is dangerous, regardless of if it's a stingray or even if you see like a whale or a dolphin outside in the uh, outside in the ocean, just assume that it can hurt you because they are still wild animals no matter what. Now, the best way to avoid rays in my experience is something called the stingray shuffle. Now, that is a way to watch your feet there. If you shuffle and just kind of kick up little clouds of dust there, clouds of sand and sediment in the water, rays really don't want to be stuck by all that and they know that you're coming. Most stings from rays happen when you surprise them or when they're caught. So as long as you're not fishing for rays or hooking them and you're not uh, kind of just sneaking up on them, you should be great. No cornering them is another big one. In my own personal experience, when I've been to the beach, when I see a stingray, I don't say anything. I tell the people in my group, but I don't make a big deal about it because people love to try and get their photos. People love to try and corner wild animals. And when any animal was cornered, that is when they may strike. And a stingray, I mean, it's in the name. And when it strikes defensively and sometimes, you know, justifiably, it uh, it's going to hurt a lot more than if you're like cornering your domestic dog or your house cat. And those attacks are few and far between. And they're not even really attacks. They're just defenses. And as long as we don't give them a reason to defend themselves, they are going to coexist with us really peacefully. They're surprisingly intelligent animals. One thing you hear a lot from uh, from surfers is there are a lot more of them around than you realize, but uh, but be, that's almost a good thing. Right? You know, the first thing you think is, oh, that's terrifying. Like there are sharks and rays around here. And they say, no, they're all if they're always here and they don't want you, that's pretty good. It means like, you know, you're you're safer than you realize as well. As yeah, that, that percentage that of attacks goes down a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, hey, so, so you mentioned, you know, we don't, we definitely don't want to sneak up on, on the wild. Don't want to try to corner them to get the, you know, the perfect selfie or anything like that. You also mentioned, um, you know, kind of ecotourism. Um, Wonders of Wildlife is a place you talked about the tank there. Uh, what are your, you know, favorite types of elasmobranchs that, that you have there at Wonders of Wildlife? And do you have any favorite encounters that you've had when observing them, seeing them do interesting things? Um, what can you tell us about, you know, the experiences that you've had right there in Missouri. So, I mean, you can't go wrong loving stingrays. Uh, if you ever come and visit us here at Wonders of Wildlife, you're gonna learn very quickly. If we can put some kind of ray in an exhibit, we will. We have a lot of rays and a lot of grouper and sharks too. But yeah, rays are our flagship there. I love them. Our stingrays are kind of famous or infamous for splashing people. And uh, they're very good at it. When I say they're intelligent, I mean it. If they know that you're able to feed them at our stingray feeding and they see you taking too long with that food, they can smell it in the water, but they know you're holding out on them. Yeah, they'll send a wave coming up at you and it's going to hit you. And uh, you got only yourself to blame. Feed our rays. Now, my personal favorite shark experience uh, really goes against all of those shark misconceptions we have. Uh, I was working a shark program with some, um, some teenagers here. And they were so excited to see our shark feeding. Our sharks are actually target trained where they will touch specific body parts to um, a target on a stick. 
and they'll actually go to those sticks for feeding. And when you hear shark feeding, you're expecting like water churning, just craziness everywhere. Our sharks are kind of moody. They remind me of cats sometimes. There is no guarantee they're going to eat. And my favorite experience was just watching the shark almost get the food and then just completely uh, curve it, completely make a U-turn. You hear the aww from everybody who's expecting this, this feeding frenzy. And I just love it because it's a really great learning experience. And it's something they remember, oddly enough. Sure, you'd remember a feeding frenzy, but you'd also remember just how laid back that one shark was at Wonders of Wildlife. Yeah, that's not what you would expect at all. That's that's pretty fascinating. So um, thank you for that. And I guess speaking of fascinating, another one that came up is, uh, is a couple of things about, you know, your favorites with your experiences. Um, so let me ask you two things, maybe at the same time. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite kind of shark? And what is your favorite obscure shark or ray fact? Oh, I think... Oh, all right. Favorite kind of shark. I do love horn sharks. They're the ones that I held up the jaws from. And we had the slide for the benthic sharks because they are so cute. And I just have these really vivid memories. You talked about shark week earlier. One of my favorite shark videos I've ever seen was of an angel shark laying flat on the bottom and a little baby horn shark swims by immediately snapped up. And then it's forced to be spat out because it has that spine on its dorsal fin that kind of tears into the mouth. Angel shark has to just spit it out and the baby horn shark just swims off like nothing happened. Really, really cool moment showcasing that they really are not squeamish about eating each other. <laughs> but my favorite obscure shark fact, it all goes back to Greenland sharks. I almost picked them as my favorite shark, but I mean, horn sharks are just so cute. Greenland shark meat, uh, we mentioned it has those urea in it uh, that help keep it from freezing, but it's actually eaten as a food called hakarl in Scandinavian countries. And if you don't ferment it right, you don't let it rot correctly, and you're just a few days off, that flesh and the ammonia and the toxins in it, they're going to flatline you. And I just think that that is really neat that these amazing sharks, which by the way, Greenland sharks are the world's uh, or as far as we know, they are the longest lived vertebrates. They've seen them over 300 years old. The fact that these sharks can be 300 years old and still pack such a punch, even when they're not going after people is just wild to me. I love it. That's pretty incredible. <laughs> that's, um, whew, that's, uh, it makes it, you know, why, why would people eat them if they, they know that, you know, you can be, you know, it's on the razor's edge of them becoming dangerous that way. But, uh, but it may also make sense that, you know, the chemicals that are in their bloodstream to protect them against that cold water probably have some some interesting byproducts yeah. to them as well. Um, another, people love asking a lot. I'm going I'm to throw just sort of a request. I love the oddball end. questions. Yeah. So, uh, so you mentioned, you know, some live to over 300 years, which is wild. Uh, we get a lot of, you know, what's the fastest, you, know, you said the biggest is the whale shark. Mm -hmm. Is the Greenland shark the one that lives the longest? Do you have any, any other kind of fun facts on the fastest, the biggest, I think we've covered biggest and smallest, uh, fastest, maybe fastest, shark. which ones live the oldest and any other facts that end in EST for both sharks and rays. I don't want to shortchange the rays. Oh, yeah. Sharks are easy to ask about, but uh, yeah. What are the superlatives we have? So the fastest shark is the short fin mako shark. Now, uh, I can't remember off of the top of my head how long they or how fast they can swim, but I know that it is at least 40 miles per hour, which may not sound as fast as you'd expect it to uh, compared to like things like cheetahs, but water and uh, like hydrodynamic uh, body types, all of that really factors in. They are fast. They are faster than you in the water like many times over. So they're fast enough. And in terms of rays, largest ray is going to be the manta ray. You do see the largest sharks and rays are not actually the ones that need to take a lot of prey in sort of a vicious predatory action, but the ones that can just hoover in a bunch of plankton. But I think the weirdest ray in the entire world, I don't think I'm going to get any argument about this. They are strange. They are called electric rays. They are not true sting rays. They're something else entirely. They've also got that sort of front half of a ray, back half of a shark thing going on, but they have these kidney shaped organs in them that are actually uh, electric. Uh, they're electric organs that can be used to stun prey, almost like an electric eel would. And I think that's really cool because a lot of people think electric eels are saltwater. They're actually freshwater, but out there in the ocean, we do have these electric fish. They were even used as, um, they were used as a medical tool in ancient Greece and ancient Rome because they would make you feel a little bit numb when you put them on you. So they would actually place them on people complaining about muscle cramps and the electric ray would shock them as a defense, which is really cool. 
That is fascinating. Wow. Thank you so much. So, so many amazing facts here, which I guess maybe leads to what we'll ask one last question here is kind of an overall one for those who find themselves hungry like a shark in a movie, not necessarily hungry like a shark at feeding time, but wonders of wild level. They're actually like, they want to devour more information about elasmobranch, sharks and rays. Uh, what would be your recommendation? If, if people want to learn more, where would you direct them? Ooh. So there are a lot of different resources that can be used to pursue information about sharks and rays outside of just paying us a visit here. And maybe if you see me walking around saying hello to me, we also on site have an amazing life science team and an amazing education team. Now, uh, outside of visiting us, you can also volunteer both with us and any sort of like reputable sea or um, marine biology institution, even zoos and aquariums. Uh, well, not even uh, aquariums, even zoos may have some sharks at them sometimes that you can get hands-on experience with. But my biggest recommendation for you guys, you may not like it because it sounds like homework, but I promise you it pays off. Do the research yourselves because it is really satisfying when you dig through this information, when you make your own uh, decisions, when you're sifting through articles that are maybe trying to trick you saying how dangerous sharks are or listing the most dangerous sharks in the world. And you think, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go and try and find other information. And I'm going to see just what the truth about sharks and rays is. When you do that, it is really satisfying because then you can do what I'm doing here and you can share that information with other people. That is just really, really rewarding. And I would love to see what kind of stuff you guys can research. Awesome. I love that answer. Yeah. Library card is a pretty amazing thing. There are great sites. We're going to share the uh, information for Wonders of Wildlife here. If you want to visit in person or uh, or visit online uh, through Varsity Tutors, if you're a Varsity Tutors learning member, we have all kinds of amazing classes on wildlife, on ocean exploration, all those kind of things. So all kinds of ways for you to be able to do that research, learn in formats like these. should also mention the team at Wonders of Wildlife is back basically every month for spotlights on other animals. So if you like this and you want to learn about more animals in a format like this, please come back and visit us. Thank you so much, Kevin, for uh, for such a, a fun event, fun class here, and uh, everybody on the team there. Um, you guys are back a lot, so here's some information about how to connect with both Far City Tutors and Wonders of Wildlife in the meantime. And I uh, hope everybody has a great holiday weekend. Stay safe if you're at the beach, but like Kevin told us, that's probably easier than you thought it would be. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>